How's everybody doing? Oh, Gatsby96 is being kind to you guys. Um, so James and I had two things we wanted to start off this um, question and answer session with. Uh, the first is um, we got a question from an agency regarding a bundled software package. Um, and this is fairly common with software where you will have, um, can everybody hear me? I'm hoping everybody can hear me. James, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. good. Okay, so you will have in uh, a software agreement um, a lot of times where you will purchase a large amount of computer equipment and it will come with some software um, in the package. Um, this will require um, two approaches to it. One will be um, GASB 87, and this will be where you will have to, um, it's essentially the same accounting, uh, but you will have to treat the, uh, the equipment, the computer equipment. Uh, you'll have to carve that out and um, account for that as computer equipment. And then you're gonna have to account for the software as software equipment. So even though it comes under the same, um, I guess, uh, contract, you'll need to put them into two different lease um, agreements. Um, so if anybody has that situation occurring when it comes through your accounting department, you'll need to make sure you approach that under the two, two goggles of GASB 87 and GASB 96. So one will be treated as one portion of that will be treated as GASB 87 and uh, treated as computer equipment. And one portion of that will be treated as uh, a SUBITA. So you will com complete your lease calculator for the SUBITA portion and then complete your lease calculator for the computer equipment. Now, if, a por now, if the software is de minimis, meaning it's so small that it really doesn't matter, then you can ignore that portion of the software completely. And a good example of this would be if you purchase, um, oh, excuse me, not purchase, if you are in a contract for um, a copier and um, the copier comes with some software that allows you to see what your um, ink levels are or helps you to, to just see what's going on with your copier machine. Um, that software is would be considered, I, I believe, a de minimis um, portion of the, the contract. So you wouldn't have to set aside a, a separate capitalization of an asset for that software. So um, that would be a good example of a de minimis um, SUBITA um, for a, 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 a software and equipment bundled contract. Um, the second thing was, James, I did not write it down. Oh, prepaids. Um, last week, it came up um, several times about prepaid, and this is very common. Um, so contracts for software, if you got into a contract for software for three years, and um, it maybe you prepaid it for um, a year or two years or three years um, last year, we put an example on our website of how to treat that. Um, we want you to go ahead and report it, um, both in your implementation file and continue to report it on your reporting package 3.07. We put a video on there um, for how to do that. Um, so please go check that on, as to how to handle that. Um, at this point, um, I hope, I hope that answers the questions. Um, we won't spend too much time on that for this, this session because we've already got the answers posted on our website. Um, and then another question that came up last week regarding um, software that is leased um, from computer, uh, excuse me, from colleges and, and universities, um, go ahead and put it on uh, our, just go ahead and report it as is. All right. Uh, let's see, I think we had something come up in our chat about is there a dollar threshold for determining the de minimis? We have not determined that yet. Um, this is going to be similar to the GASB 87 process where 
initially in the GASB 87 process that happened last year, we had everyone turn in everything. And then based off what was turned in initially, we established what would be considered uh, materiality for Sabitas. And we had to put that through to our auditors. And then we came up with the materiality thresholds and then published that for you guys. Um, we're gonna have to do the same thing here. We're gonna have to come up with, we're gonna have to get everything in and then determine what is the materiality thresholds uh, for you guys. So I'm sorry, we have to do that to y'all again, but everything's on the table at this point, And then we will tell you what's de minimis or not. So um, you just have to submit everything. Um, one other thing that I've gotten a couple questions on, if you guys have nothing that's a Sabita, so y'all are the lucky people who either you don't have any Sabitas or everything that you have that would be a Sabita is one year or less, just send us an email after you've done your due diligence, um, send us an email and we'll mark you as done and you're done. So that, that lucky for you guys. Um, and the other thing is we've covered this before last week, but if you have um, all your submittals are under the um, Department of Administration, Department of Technology, um, you, and they're more than a year, go ahead and fill out your implementation file. If you go to our website, we give a, an example. Um, let's see, I think it's the video um, that is the example, it, the video's name is, it, I think it's called contract, to, uh, from contract to implementation, an example. I think that's the name of it. But if you go to the 14 minute mark, um, that is where I give you the exact way how to do it. If you are a, um, uh, if you fall in, under that category where uh, you have a lease, excuse me, a software through Department of Administration or Department of, um, well, really, if you have a software uh, contract or software lease through another agency, that's, you go to the 14 minute mark and that'll, that'll show you how to handle it there. Um, so let's open up the floor to questions. And you can either put them in the chat or you can talk. And if I know you, I'll probably pick on you a little bit. So, um, I hope, I hope you guys don't mind. Okay, what about software through other agencies such as ETD? Um, yes, um, any software that comes through any agency, um, we had put on our lease um, implementation file, we had put department of technology or department administration because they are the majority of who agencies lease through, but there are other agencies that provide software to um, other agencies. So yeah, if it's it that it would fall under that same category. And I think I've got the implementation file up. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Let's see if I can do it. Um, I hope you guys can see this, but if oh uh, yuck yuck yuck! Sorry, I wish I could have had this quite ready. Um, sorry, there is a question right in here somewhere. Well, there's a question, I think it's column U. Yeah, right here. Um, so in this question right here, it really, this is any agency. If you're leasing from, if you are um, getting a, a software provided through any uh, agency, you would say yes here. And then you would go over to the notes section and then just say what agency you're, you're leasing it through or, or you're getting it through. Yeah, and that, that would be all we need. We just need you to fill out the um, first column or two where it's software description. 
um, just so we know what, what it is, and then fill out the yes that you're getting it from another agency, and then in the note section, just put what agency is it from. We don't need a full payment schedule or anything like that from you for those uh, line items. Um, we just need the name, because what we're going to do is once we get the information from um, admin, we would look for that item on their list. Okay, so Christina Jordan, if we have a lease software under a state term contract, which is longer than year, one year, but we have only a PO for one year that is considered, this is considered to be a short term lease. Um, that see. would highly depend on the contract itself. Um, so if when you purchase and pay that software, are you, purchase, are you purchasing it for more than one year? Is that, is that well, you have a PO for one year is the contract you've signed, is that obligating you for more than one year? I know that there's some, some vendors and it's vendor to vendor. There's some vendors that have situations where you have a PO for each year, but you are committed to do it for three years. You're kind of locked in. Uh, there's some that you were per truly just purchasing one year's worth. Um, it's very, it's very in the details, in the weeds for that kind of thing. You'll, you'll have to look at the state term contract itself. Um, and what you're paying for. Okay, so I have the next question. Um, should we take the approach of when in doubt listed out on our implementation review as a show of due diligence for the auditors? Um, what gets submitted to us for implementation is what we are going to consider for setting up as an asset. So you might want to consider having two different files. You might want to consider having one file that you keep for yourself for due diligence and then one file that you submit to us as what you want to set up, that you want to uh, set up for um, an asset. So um, that would be my suggestion. Um, if she you meant for due diligence, she had a follow-up question, Kevin. What? She had a she had a follow up question um, that, that for internal review absolutely list out everything I would recommend what you send to us is what Catherine means is what you send to us should truly be what you believe is qualifies as submit agree yes but for internal review and as far as due diligence we would highly recommend looking through literally everything you have um, and documenting your decision on it just so that when the auditors do come knocking um, you can say that you've done that full review. Yeah, so um, I'm going to share this screen again. This master da data screen that we have, it is linked to two, two um, tabs in here. One is this create asset tab, and then one, the second one is this abs on tab. And both of these tabs are going to be used to set up the Sabita asset in skis. So, um, the point of this master data sheet is to, to create the asset in ski. Well, there's, there's two points really, um, is to create the asset in skis and then also to set up this payment schedule for you so that once the asset is set up, then you have a amortization schedule uh, to track the payment in skis for you and you guys right now are have submitted already to Kelly your GASB 87 closing package I think it's 3.09 where you were tracking your principal and interest GL breakdown the split between principal and interest GL uh, excuse me princ principal and interest the, the split between the two and tracking that the G to the um, GL and how you're paying it and making sure that the pay downs are agreeing to the GL and you're going to be doing the same thing with your Sabetta. Um, so what you're doing here is, is twofold. Um, and I know I'm repeating myself, so I'm sorry. I apologize about that. I, I find that I, I say things twice. It's probably the, the mob in me. But um, you're setting up your asset for skis and you're setting up your future payment schedule. So starting July 1st, once we get this approved starting July 1st, your assets won't be set up in skis starting July 1st, but your payment schedules will be. So starting July 1st, um, 
what we mean by being ready to go July 1st is that these payment schedules are already there for you. So when you make your first payment after July 1st, it will agree to this principal and interest breakdown. Um, so I would be wary, going back to your question of, do we want to throw everything in the schedule to show our auditors? I wouldn't want to do that because you might you might end up with doing too much and then having to keep track of too much um, because you won't have to amortize everything and you don't have to um, reconcile everything to the GL uh, if it's not a Sabita. So um, for due diligence purposes, I would keep maybe an internal one, but for um, our purposes, only submit what you truly want classified excuse me, what you truly want set up as an asset. Yeah, and we had a question for, um, should we submit a list of all subscriptions that are for one year? Um, no, uh, to qualify as a bit, it has to be one, it has to be greater than one year. Anything that's one year or less will be treated as a short term. Uh, and that, treat, that accounting treatment is basically the same as what it is currently. It would be expense, and anything that was prepaid ahead of time would have to be reported as a prepaid expense in, in our closing package. Um, anything that's greater than one year is what would potentially qualify as a SBITDA. Uh, to look at that, you have to look at what the contract terms are, whether or not you plan to renew it, if that contract terms allow for a renewal, um, which, I mean, we can segue into a different question. We've had a couple questions lately about... Um, what makes a contract um, long-term greater than one year versus less than one year? Um, there is a lot of nuance to it. You've got to look at the individual contract itself. But in general, if the contract itself does not have any language as far as renewals, it's just for 12 months and then it ends, um, but you, your agency plans to keep doing that. And a good example of that would be our personal Netflix, or I guess Netflix is monthly, um, like Amazon Prime or something like that. You pay for it for one year, you then are planning on paying for it for the next year. Well, you aren't locked into paying for it next year. There's nothing in your contract that says that you have to. There's also nothing in your contract that says that um, that company has to give you a certain price for the next five years or anything like that. What we're looking for as far as multi-year contracts with renewals is stuff that in the contract it says, you can pay for pay $50 for this year, and then for the next five years, you have the option to renew at $50. Um, that's the kind of thing that you need to look at your intent to renew. If it really is just a contract for 12 months, like you, it's a statewide contract, you purchase a 12-month 12 12 um, license, that would truly be a short term. Um, so you've got to look at the contract itself and what the intent is and what's in, what's in writing. Um, to figure that kind of thing out. But anything that's one year or less in general is not gonna get qualified um, as a submit up. Another good way to think about it is, um, can you get sued? <laughs> so if you stop paying or if at some is, will you, can you sue them for breach of contract or can they sue you for breach of contract? So um, that would be another way to, way to think of it. Um, do we include a subscription if it's free? No, if it's free, then there's nothing to set up as an asset or liability. Um, so um, there has to be some sort of exchange or exchange-like transaction. And that's part of GASB 96 is they, they describe it as an exchange. So you have to, there has to be an exchange of goods and services. So, uh, excuse me, not services. Well, um, you can't get, there has to be money that has to be transacting between um, vendors. Okay, if we pay for multiple software leases on a single invoice, do we have to have separate schedules for each piece of lease software or can we combine them into one schedule? Um, the asset has to be set up if the asset has different terms, um, if the asset has different, well, it has to be set up on, on, on the correct terms. So, um, according to the payment, according to the um, time period. Um, so that's how your agency is gonna set it up. If your agency wants to, if you have um, software, if you wanna bundle it into one for, the e for your agency, um, for ease, that's fine. As long as it has the exact same terms, the same life, that's fine. 
um, it might create a problem. It might make it easier on one end, but harder on the other. So it might make it easier on you on this side on the implementation file and setting it up, but it might make it harder when you go to pay it um, because you might have multiple uh, invoices or vice versa. So it's going to be up to you guys how you want to set it up. But just keep in mind the how you set up the asset has to be spot on. So, you know, once you have to, it, it just has to agree to the, the time schedule. Uh, so if it's three years, it has to be three years. Um, you can't put a three-year asset, you can't combine a three-year asset with a five-year asset. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. Um, I had a question also about internet services. Um, I do not believe that internet services qualifies as a Sabita. Uh, a Sabita is a is licensing a software asset. So one of the criteria is that you have to gain access to software that you ordinarily would not have, and you have control and use over that. Uh, internet would be more like utility. Um, so that, that would not qualify as a Sabita, but it, it, you would have to be getting a software asset that uh, you could use and um, control use of. Hey, hey Catherine, um, this is, this is uh, Tracy Hill. Um, quick question about the putting the prepaid on the, on the form, on, on the spreadsheet. We have one, we have um, some software that starts uh, February 14th of this year. And it goes until June 30th of next year. So as of July 1st, it's really only one year. However, the contract spans over um, almost 18 months. How is that handled? Just so we can understand, y'all prepaid that entirely up front in February? That's correct. Okay. Um, for now, what we're asking y'all to do is to put that on the implementation file. And when you do the payment schedule, you'd put in the full amount in February. And so if you actually look at our implementation file, it goes and it looks at um, present value of payments as of 7-1. That line would be zero right now. We still want y'all to fill that out. We are talking right now with um, the auditors, OSA to figure out the best accounting treatment for that, whether or not we have to go back and capture that amount from before and prorate it based on what's remaining or um, or what. But if it is something that is greater than one year um, in total, we do want y'all to include it. Um, it may not get capitalized this time around, but we do wanna know about it for now um, so that we can then going forward, next time y'all sign that, y'all it would qualify as a bit of. Um, so we want to know about it now just so we can include it in our calculations for de minimis. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling that out, filling that line item out best you can. And then in the notes column, just putting something like paid up front or anything like that, just so that we can filter it out and look at it. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at it. It may or may not get capitalized now, but we do want to just see it, if that makes sense. Yeah. A lot of software is paid up front and paid annually. Um, so like if you have a software agreement for three years, you're going to pay it three times. I don't know if that makes any sense. You'll pay it annually three times, um, which is different from a lot of your equipment, which is mostly paid monthly. Um, so that's going to be just a different, just, just different. But back to that question. I'm not even sure in, in this situation if it even would be a submitted because at this point it, it might it might be less than a year, although actually it's 14 months. So it'd be four, you'd have 14 months left if I'm if I'm thinking of this right. So it would still be a submitted um, because it, you would have 14 months left in the, the software. Okay. All right. So next question. Let's see. James, do you see what the next question is? Yes. Um, so if you have a software subscription license um, and you pay support, support and maintenance and that kind of thing, um, if those are separately listed, all you would need to include are the pieces that are the software license pieces. 
uh, the maintenance support, all of those costs, those would be expensed as incurred. Uh, the part that you need to capitalize is truly the software license piece. That's the part that they're looking at. Um, so where contracts are, are multi-components with that kind of thing, you do need to look at what you're paying for. Because um, like we said, the maintenance piece is not a Sabita. You need to shave that off. Yeah, so um, I always like to understand the, the whys of everything. Like why does GASB say that not to capitalize services and maintenance agreements? And it really just goes back to what they consider as an asset versus what they don't. And it's kind of a frustrating thing because it really makes you have to put on like an ivory tower type hat. But maintenance and services just aren't considered assets under accounting theory. And so you just kind of have to, um, when you look at your contracts, you just have to look at maintenance and services and go, that's not an asset. Um, they don't consider that an asset. So you have to kick that out. Um, the price, the prices and the costs for that, you have to kick that out when you're computing what you're going to capitalize. And it's frustrating and it's a lot of bureaucracy, um, but it's just what GASB is telling us to do. Yeah. And kind of a similar question came up next of um, website annual maintenance and hosting fees with third-party payment processor. Um, with website hosting fees and that kind of thing once again you need to ask yourself what are you getting for paying for this license um the idea of, of a sabita is you're paying for a license to gain access to a software product um specifically excludes where you pay services to a third party um and so it depends on the details but i would think that a website annual maintenance, if you're paying someone, a contractor to come in and update your websites and maintain it, that kind of thing, I wouldn't think that would qualify as a Sabita. Um, hosting fees for a third-party processor, I wouldn't think that would qualify as a Sabita. If you're paying someone to help you process your, your payments, I wouldn't think so. If you're paying for um, a certain software that lets you do that internally, that would that's where we have a different conversation. Um, so it, you really do need to think about, am I getting a software product that my employees or my, my um, citizens that we serve are getting to use that if I did not pay this license, they wouldn't get to? Um, or I, am I paying a third party for a service that they provide that we use? Um, it, it's, it's very minute. So if y'all have any questions that are specific to any examples y'all might have, feel free to reach out and email us. We can help you think through it. Um, but from a high level, that, that's, that's the intent of GASME 96. Um, next question is, what if you aren't sure you'll renew the subscription when it expires? Um, so if you have a software um, license, and uh, your contract is for five years, um, and you uh, have the option to renew it for five years, and in the contract it says you're locked in for five years, you can renew it every year, um, but the, I know a lot of state contracts are set up so that if you have an out, if you don't get funding, um, which that doesn't necessarily work, or you have a cancellation policy um, that may or may not work, but you intend to extend it, and then you realize, oh, maybe I'm not planning on extending it, the way that that works is, are you likely or not likely? So that's a judgment call on your agency. Is Are you more than likely, are you not planning on renewing it? Um, then you wouldn't count it towards the subscription term. So it may or may not be less than a year at that point. If you think that you will renew it, um, more likely than not, then you would need to include it. So that's a judgment call. Um, you're, you, I mean, you're probably leaning one way or another. Um, so that, that's a judgment call on, on the agency of what the intent is with that software. Uh, perpetual software license or hosting. I would think that hosting is probably a service. Um, the license itself is perpetual. Um, once again, perpetual licenses don't fall under Sabitas. If the only thing we're worried about with Sabitas is stuff where you have to we are, you're temporarily leasing the software. 
Um, once again, think back, this is that, this is the same as leasing equipment. This is the, the sister um, Gatsby pronouncement to that. So if you were to go out and buy a computer, you would not be leasing that computer, you own that computer. If you go out and buy a perpetual software subscription, you own that software now, you're not leasing that software. Therefore, that software would not be a Civita. Um, so perpetual license definitely wouldn't be a Civita. The hosting fees related to it, I would think are probably more of a maintenance ongoing fee that you just expense as, as ongoing. So um, SurveyMonkey or GoToMeeting webinar, um, that I'm thinking that would be included as an asset if you're paying for it, um, um, if it's more than a year, uh, if it's not perpetual. Um, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that that would count, um, assuming it meets a lot of the Civita criteria. Yeah. It yeah, I, I would survey monkey would be a software that would potentially be a Sabita. It, it would, you'd have to then look at the contracts. Similar question we just had was on WebEx. Um, WebEx would more than would definitely be a Sabita. You're gaining access to a software. You're you're paying for it temporarily. You're getting subscription. Um, we haven't looked into personally. We haven't looked into the WebEx um, subscriptions for the state. Um, them, it's individual with each agency, I believe, um, but. The question is going to be, how is your agency paying for WebEx? How long are you locked in? Is it truly just an annual subscription? Like, are y'all paying for 12 months of WebEx? And at the end of that 12 months, do you have no contractual obligation to keep paying for WebEx? Um, or have y'all paid for um, a first year in a three-year kind of locked-in contract? Um, that would be the question. Are you paying annually for a contract that's somewhat committed for those next three years? Did you get like a discount rate uh, where they say, you, you, if you pay for us three years, we'll give you this price, keep paying us? Or is it truly a, we're going to pay for one year, the next year we're going to pay for next year? Um, that's what determines whether or not you have to look at intent to continue to renew. Um, one example of that would be... Um, We'll go back to Amazon Prime. I have the intent to continue to renew Amazon Prime for my family, but that intent to renew does not matter because I'm paying for it in 12 month increments with no contractual obligation to continue to pay them. That makes it a short term Sabita. It makes the term only 12 months. I don't have to worry about capitalizing it. But if there were something in the contract, like with WebEx, there's something in the contract that says that. I can pay for 12 months for the first time at this rate, and then I have the option to renew at a certain price for the next five months or five years. That's where you have to work look at the intent. If, there's tr if it's truly a one-year subscription, but there is no contract, but you do intend to renew, doesn't matter. The maximum length is 12 months. Each time you renew, that would be a, that's effectively a new contract in, in Gatsby 96 eyes. So you just had you'd have uh, a short term Sabita, you would expense it as you pay it. So James, just to be clear, so what James is saying is that the only time intent matters, so when intent matters, the only time that matters is when there's a clause in the contract on pricing. Maybe not just pricing, but yes. So the, take it back to what kind of inspired GASME 96 is leases, GASME 87. And so we use this example in our overview. Um, when you lease a piece of equipment, like a backhoe, you lease it and you take it from that leaseor and you now have that backhoe and you can use it however you want. You'd lease it for a year, but what you do is you lease it for a year and you have a five-year option to renew. So you have the option to next year, I still need that backhoe. We haven't finished our project. I'm going to lease it from you and continue to lease it from you. The idea is that the company can't come in and take that backhoe from you and make your company, make your agency not be able to accomplish the things you want to accomplish because of scarcity and all that kind of thing. That doesn't really apply that well in the software digital world because it's not like they can run out of software and that kind of thing. Um, but that's the idea. It's There should be something in the contract that has to do with renewal options. Um, and that's where you have to look at intent to renew. 
Um, if I was to truly just go out and buy a 12 month subscription to something that that's when you don't have to worry about intent. If it's, there's something in that contract related to renewal options, that's where you need to start thinking about intent to renew. So uh, does everybody understand that? Because we, we do get a lot, we have gotten a lot of questions in the last um, couple of weeks about intent to renew. Um, and it does seem like there, it, it's, it's a very nuanced area and that's where you really have to get into your contracts and understand if there's any language in the contract around renewals. And so if you have any renewal language in your contract, that's when you need to start looking at what is your intent to renew. So does anybody have any any in further questions on that? And if and if you come up with more questions later, that's fine. We don't have to this this conversation isn't done right now on the intent to renew. But if you come up with questions later, that's fine. But that it it's it's a nuanced um it's a nuanced area. But if you really do have just a one-year contract and it's just year to year and there's no language in there about renewals, but you know you're going to renew it year to year, uh, it's, it's not a sabita as long as that contract is just a straightforward year to year contract. Yeah. And in that and case, it, intent does not matter as long as it's just a year to year contract. Yeah, and Jenny, your point right now is a good one. A lot of one year subscriptions are online renewal, there's no contract, and that's true. The, the intent of Gatsby 96 wasn't to capture everything in the world that's a software subscription. For the vast majority of stuff that's like, you might, you might have the same programs on your home computer as you do at work. For the, the vast majority of those kind of things, they really are one year. Um, it's the stuff that's more specialized that you have to go to specialty vendors that have custom made software, um, like client tracking software. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, legal database software that you have to worry about where you're paying for multiple years. It's stuff like that where the companies are locking you in for multiple years. Adobe Pro, you're paying by year. It's, it's not going to really qualify. It's the bigger stuff, the more complex stuff. that More is specialized. Maybe, well, yeah, special, specialized stuff that's probably going to fall under this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the things that you're renewing uh, one year to the next, they're more like invoiced software. They're not really, they're not even really contract software. They're just kind of invoiced. We have anything else? Okay. Um, well, if we don't have anything else, um, this one, it seems like it's gone a lot quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if y'all have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Give us both a call. Um, it, if there's anything that comes up uh, very detailed, feel free to send us an email with some of those details so we can research a little bit and better understand it. Um, and we'll get, definitely get back to you. Um, we want to do everything we can to help y'all out so we can uh, get this rolling uh, before we get busy with year end. Yeah, and if you remember, the June 10th is the deadline, which... Um, that is going to be coming up very quickly. Um, I will be happy to host, we will be happy to host another question and answer session next um, Tuesday, which is the 31st. I uh, can't imagine there's gonna be a lot of people that will be around since that's the uh, day after Memorial Day, but I will be happy to host, host that. Um, but that June 10th deadline is very strict um and make sure you guys turn in your packages um oh and i'm going to share our screen one more time i wanted to show something i did not hit it very well in our videos um but 
um, this will be more important for you guys than it is for us. But this area right here, this step four, this is where y'all um, want the assets coded for um, when the assets get set up. So this is going to be, and this inventory in, inventory number and serial number, I don't care. We don't care what goes in there. We put, um, initially, I think we had nothing in there. You could put uh, TBD or you could put anything in there, but that that's for you guys, um, tracking number. Um, so I uh, just was gonna let you guys know that. But um, make sure y'all fill this out too of where you want the software information to go. And, and also a lot of this information, a lot of the software that y'all have already is already in your system. When y'all are setting up your assets, go ahead and do yourself the favor. And when you complete your lease calculator, make sure the payment amounts for your lease calculator already agree to what you've um gotten in your system for the, the have already posted in your system for the gl just in total um because it it would to go through all this and to come up with a lease calculator for july and you think that you're supposed to pay twelve dollars when really in the system you're only paying ten you're already going to guarantee yourself a journal entry of two dollars so um just make just go ahead and check yourself and make sure that this agrees to um, what you're already seeing in your system. So, you know, that'll make sure, guarantee you've got your taxes um, on top of, you've got, include, you've included your taxes in your calculation. Um, and um, for this fund and cost center, uh, you only have one line item, just put the, 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 the majority line, majority fund um, and cost center, uh, just something that'll cue you in of um, where the you for the most part where you want the software subscription to go it's this is really just more just to cue you in it's not it's, this isn't um, this isn't you know the end all be all so that's that's really it on this end we had a, another question come in um, about phone software for cell phones and VoIP um, we had a question on this a month or so ago um, when we first started looking into all, everything um, on similar to this, and we looked through some of the contracts. Um, so I would recommend doing the same thing. Um, are you paying for this as part of your phone bill? Are you paying for it monthly? Um, are you locked in uh, to this software? Um, what's the payment process for this? So if it really is a software, it could potentially be Sabita, but what you need to look at is what is the contract to it. Um, so if it's something to do with like usage, like every month you have a phone bill, you have phone lines, you might increase, decrease the phone lines for your agency as you use them, and that can change month to month. Um, then that phone software, you know, surcharge that they're charging you for that would more than likely not be something you're locked into for more than a year. Um, because you have the option to take away all of your phone lines or add phone lines, that kind of thing. Um, I would recommend looking at what that, how that's billed and how that's contracted out, because um, that would determine whether or not it was via Sabita. It could potentially be a Sabita, um, but it, it, it depends on what that underlying rules are. Um, also, you'd need to look at whether or not it is um, de minimis. Is it a very small amount compared to what your actual cell phone leasing is? Um, that kind of thing. But uh, from the example we looked at with a different agency a couple months ago, it did not seem like it was a Sabita just because every month they had the option to increase and decrease the phone lines and they could decrease them to zero, in which case they wouldn't pay anything. Um, so the way we looked at it is it was short term. Um. Does everybody understand on um, we 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 covered this last time, but the difference between um, variable versus fixed? I don't think it'd hurt to go over it. You what? I don't think it would hurt to go over it. You want to hit that, James? Sure. Um, so once you know that something qualifies as a Sabita, it's more than one year. It's definitely software, that kind of thing. 
uh, you have to figure out what you're supposed to capitalize, what dollar amount you need to capitalize. Um, and it's, it can be complex because you might have a piece of that contract that's related to um, number of users or how often you use it or um, number of queries you hit against a database, anything like that, that might be variable month to month. Um, the amount that you actually have to capitalize is the amount that's substantially fixed in time. And so you know that you're gonna have to pay $100 a month for 100 users to use this software that you have for the next three years. But after you had 100 users, the company lets you say, all right, if you need an extra user this month, that's an extra dollar per user. Um, and that can fluctuate up and down, but you're locked into that 100 users. That first 100 users of $100, that would be your fixed costs. The variable costs that might cause your bill to vary every month, like one month you might pay $100, the next month you might pay 120 because you have a temporary, temporary employees over the summer. And the end of the summer, you go back down to 100 because you don't need those extra licenses. That variable cost would not need to be capitalized because it's not fixed. You don't know it's going to occur. Um, and so I guess a good question to ask yourself is when you're doing these payment schedules now, what do you know you're going to have to pay for this software subscription for the whole term? For the next three years, you know that you're going to have to pay this amount. Um, if it's indexed, like they say, like you're going to have to pay $100 for these three months, and then you're going to pay 10% uh, extra the, for the next three months, then 10% extra for the next three months. That is variable, but you, you it's fixed. You know what it's going to be. You can say right now, I know that this is how much I'm going to pay later on. That you would include. It's, I don't know how many employees I'm going to have six months from now, how many extra licenses I'm going to have to have. That's where you would say that's variable. And when you get your bill, you would put uh, the piece that is fixed against principal and interest and then you would pit the piece that was variable against uh, contingent ex um, executory um, expense, and that would be how you paid the bill and actually do your, um, your PF, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's kind of a, tr it's a tricky thing, but it's basically, it's what are you contractually bound to pay regardless of what changes in the con like regardless of of the variable changes in the contract if, if that makes sense but there's there are questions on the implementation file that we asked that are somewhat confusing which it says, are there variable payments based on the future performance or usage of the asset? So this would be where he was talking about, is there that, do you have to pay a dollar per person? So will the bill go up or down based on how many people come on or off? So if you have that component of the contract, you would answer yes. So if there, if you have that, then you would say yes. And then that, that portion of the contract would go into, that's where you would put that into your contingency expense account. And that's very similar to the GASB 87 that you're doing now, like with your copiers, like if you have a cost per copy expense, um, you're putting that cost per copy expense into your contingency account. And that same, that same principle applies with software. So if you have a cost per head that goes up or down month to month, depending on how many people are on that software license, that is a variable payment. So you would answer yes here, and then you would describe it here. And then right here, where it says, does the payment amount change? That does not have anything to do with this question. That payment amount changing is talking about is, is there like an index in the, the payment amount going through the years? Like, does it, you know, is the first year at $1,000 fixed? And then is the next year at $1,500? And then is the next year at $2,000? And I hope that makes sense. 
I see Tracy Hill shaking his head, but I'm not sure if he's shaking his head at us. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Wait. Okay. Are you shaking your head? <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. She, yeah, she is. Okay. She is. All right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Uh, any other questions before we sign off? Great. Well, I hope you all have a great week. Um, please let us know if there's anything we can do um, and we'll continue to be in touch.